Hi, my name is Michael Trower. Welcome to this talk about point of care ultrasound and shock. And as always, let's start with the case. So this was a case I saw recently, a 15 year old male who had presented with two weeks of worsening shortness of breath and lethargy. He had no significant medical history or medications. He was hypotensive, 65 on 40, a bit tachycardic and tachypneic, but his other observations were normal. So he was being seen in the shared adult pediatric resuscitation area, and one of the pediatricians happened to see me walk past and just grabbed me and said, Michael, do you mind giving me a hand with this chap? I don't know why his blood pressure is low. Could you help me with an ultrasound scan? And I said, sure. So I used a structured shock protocol for this young man uh, called HiMAP. So we started with the heart, and there are three things we look for in the heart, tamponade, RV strain, and LV impairment. Then we look at the IVC, Morrison's pouch, looking for free fluid in the abdomen, aorta, and then the pleura. There's three things we look for in the pleura as well, pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax if it's causing shock, pleural effusion, and pulmonary edema. So first we looked at this young man's heart, and the first view that I went for was the parasternal long axis view. So the probe marker is to the patient's right shoulder, and the beam of the ultrasound is going through the long axis of the heart like this. And this is what I saw. So this is a parasternal long axis view. We have a bit of right ventricle at the top, left ventricle lengthened out here, left atrium, mitral valve. And as we said, there are three things that we look for on this view. Tamponade, RV strain, and LV function. So in terms of tamponade, pericardial fluid tends to accumulate behind the heart here, between the myocardium and the pericardium, and it tends to point in front of the descending aorta here. So it goes between the heart and the descending aorta, as opposed to pleural fluid, which tends to go behind the descending aorta. So there's no suggestion of pericardial fluid, so there's no tamponade. Second thing is RV strain. So it's not a great view of the RV here, but there's no suggestion that it's dilated, but we'll need to check this on some other views. And then the third thing is LV function. So a nice way of eyeballing LV function is to imagine a point in the middle of the LV chamber. So just where I've got the laser pointer hovered there. And we know that fractional shortening means that the walls should come in by about a third. So that's a normal ejection fraction. So the septum and the free wall should come towards the middle of the chamber by one third. So if it was three centimeters between the septum and the middle of the chamber, and between the free wall and the middle of the chamber, then they should each move in by one centimeter. So have a look and see what you think. So there's reduced LV function. Those walls are not coming in normally. One other useful marker of LV function on this view is to look at this anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and see how close it gets to the septum. So in a normal heart, it should really slap up and hit the septum or come very close to the septum. If it leaves a big gap, that's a sign that there could be impaired LV function. So what do you think? Is there a big gap? Yeah, there is. So next let's look at a normal heart so we can compare what this heart looks like to a normal parasternal long axis. So here's a normal heart. So let's go through those two methods of assessing LV function again. So we imagine a point in the middle of the LV chamber, and we look to see how much the walls are coming in towards that point. So the septum and the free wall are both coming in much more than in our case. They're also thickening more, so this is normal function. And also the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is really slapping up and hitting the septum. It's not leaving any gap, so this is normal. Okay, and we'll go back to our case once more, just so you can compare again. So imagining a point there, can you see the walls are not quite coming in as they were in the normal example, and they're also not thickening as much. And this anterior leaflet is not slapping up and hitting the septum like it was in the normal example. It's leaving a gap. So you can use M mode to quantify how close that mitral valve leaflet gets to the septum. So we put the M mode line through the tips of the mitral valve, and so we get this picture below. So along the Y axis are the structures along the M mode line, and along the X axis is time. So this speckled structure here is the septum, then the black or anechoic gap here is the LV chamber, 
Then this thin line within the LV chamber is the mitral valve leaflets moving around. The E point is the point at which the mitral valve leaflets are closest to the septum. And so the gap between the E point and the septum is called the E point septal separation. And so you can measure that distance. And here it's just over one centimeter. It should be seven millimeters or less. So this is increased suggesting impaired LV function. Okay, so that was the first view of the heart. So now we'll look at another view. So it's always good to get at least a couple of views of the heart. So this is the apical four-chamber view. So this is the apical four-chamber view. So we have the probe here at the patient's apex, the septum down the middle, this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle, with the atria down here. So what do you think? If we hover the laser pointer in the middle of the chamber, are the walls coming in normally? No, they're not. It's similar to the parastonal long that we saw earlier. We don't see the free wall very well on this view, but from what we can see of the septum and a bit of the apex, they're not moving in towards the middle of the chamber normally. Also, the RV seems to be equally affected. The mitral valve annulus and the tricuspid annulus should move up and down from the base to the apex of the heart by a centimeter on the left and by about two centimeters on the right. These are measurements called MAPSI and TAPSI that you might have heard of. You can measure these with M mode, but also just from eyeballing, we get an impression that it's not moving up and down normally on either side. So this just builds up a bit of a case that the LV and RV function are both affected in this young man. Okay, so we've finished with the heart. So now we move on to the second step of the high map, which is IVC. So we place the probe here, just below the Ziffy sternum, in the midline, in the sagittal plane. So here's the IVC in long axis, the patient's head to the left of screen, feet to the right of screen, so liver anteriorly, and then the IVC running up behind the liver into the right atrium here. And there are two things we look for in terms of the IVC. One is diameter and two is collapsibility. So in terms of diameter, these are two centimeter notches. So it's just over two centimeters. So it's on the full side. And then in terms of collapsibility, it looks like it might be collapsing a bit here, right? But that's actually just because the probe is slightly slipping off the middle of the vein. Because if we look down here, there's actually minimal collapsibility. So the IVC should normally collapse you know, around 50% with respiration. If it's collapsing more than that, that suggests it could be underfilled. If it's collapsing less than that, that suggests maybe the patient has fluid overload. But IVC is not a definitive test for fluid state. There are many other things that can affect the IVC. So it should be factored in with everything else with the rest of your clinical assessment. But having said that, this IVC does look quite plump. It's over two centimeters, it's not collapsing much. So you could call this a plethoric IVC. So the next step in the high map system is to look at Morrison's pouch for free fluid. So we look here in the right upper quadrant, but we also look in the left upper quadrant and the pelvis. So just like a fast exam. So then the fourth step of the high map is the aorta. So we look here in the middle of the abdomen for both aneurysm and dissection. But again, in this demographic, I didn't think this was particularly relevant. So we decided to skip over this part of the protocol as well. So that brings us on to the final part of the protocol, P for pleura. So in the original high map paper by Scott Weingart, he actually refers to P as pneumothorax. So we look here, in the anterior zones in the mid-clavicular line for lung sliding to rule out a tension pneumothorax as the cause of the patient's shock. And this is what I saw. So from the top, this is some subcutaneous fat. This is muscle. This is a rib with a shadow. You can just see a little bit of another rib here with a shadow. And then just deep to the ribs is the pleural line, this bright white line. And we're looking for a thing called lung sliding, which is a sort of shimmering appearance along that pleural line. So as the patient breathes in and out, the visceral and parietal pleura, if they're together, should create this kind of shimmering back and forth, dynamic moving appearance. And there lung sliding is present, so we can rule out a pneumothorax at that point. And here is on the left, and again, lung sliding is present. So there's no significant pneumothorax on either side. So let's summarize the findings from the high map. So in terms of the heart, there was globally and severely impaired biventricular function. 
and the relevant, relevant negatives were no tamponade and no IV strain. The IVC was plethoric, so it was fat and not collapsing. Morrison's and aorta we decided to skip over because we didn't think they were relevant for this demographic. And then in terms of the pleura, there was no pneumothorax, and I didn't show you the images, but also there was no significant effusion or pulmonary edema. So when I went in to see this case, uh, the team had quite a broad differential. You know, they were drawing up IV antibiotics to cover for sepsis. There was really no particular suggestion of any specific condition. But within a couple of minutes, you know, we had a clear diagnosis. I could tell them you know, this young man has clear signs of cardiogenic shock. There's no other signs of any obstructive shock or anything else going on. You know, I'd recommend hold off the fluids, start him on some inotropes. And I think this was really useful. I mean, of course, he got a formal echo later in the day, which gave an exact ejection fraction. But right from the beginning of this case, the whole team knew the diagnosis. We were able to get him on the right treatment right from the beginning. We didn't need to waste time and uh, effort with other investigations. Uh, we could explain to the patient what was going on, what was the, the working diagnosis. And so in this case, I thought the point of care ultrasound added a lot to his management. Okay, now let's go back to basics and talk about the four types of shock and how ultrasound can be used in each type. So hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributive. So for hypovolemic shock, we've talked a bit about how ultrasound can be used to look for signs of hypovolemia, so a narrow collapsible IVC. But also we can potentially identify sources of hypovolemia. So free fluid in the chest or the abdomen or AAA, for example. In terms of cardiogenic shock, of course, we'll look at the ECG for a rhythm cause. But in terms of ultrasound, the main two areas will be looking for LV function, as we've talked about. And then a slightly more advanced application would be looking for severe valvular disease, which could, of course, have a big impact on your management of that patient's hemodynamics. In terms of obstructive shock, there are three main types, so tamponade, tension pneumothorax and a massive PE, and all of these can be identified with POCUS. So tamponade, we've talked a bit about identifying a pericardial effusion, then diagnosing tamponade is another step which is a bit more technical, which we won't cover in this talk. Tension pneumothorax can easily be ruled out by looking for lung sliding, and then massive PE, as well as looking for signs of RV strain, actually a more specific sign of a PE is to identify a DVT. In terms of distributive shock, so there are two types of distributive shock, septic and anaphylactic. Neither of these can really be identified by point of care ultrasound. However, you may identify sources of sepsis. So for example, pneumonia or cholecystitis. So a really nice way of uh, conceptualizing how ultrasound works for shock is the pump, tank and pipe system. So here we have across the top of the table the four types of shock and then along the side we have pump, tank and pipes. And let me walk you through the table. So in hypovolemic shock you expect a hyperdynamic pump, often empty with kissing LV walls, a flat collapsing IVC and you may see sources of hypovolemia, so free fluid or AAA for example. In cardiogenic shock you tend to see a hypodynamic or dilated pump often with a plethoric IVC and possibly some other signs of fluid overload, such as free fluid and B lines suggesting pulmonary edema. In obstructive shock, as we said, there are three types. So tamponade, PE, where you will see RV strain, plus or minus a DVT, and then tension pneumothorax. But in all three causes of obstructive shock, you expect a plethoric IVC. So if you see a narrow collapsing IVC, you can pretty much rule out all the three causes of obstructive shock straight away. And finally, in distributive shock, as we said, this is probably the least useful type of shock for ultrasound. You could potentially see a source of the sepsis, but ultrasound is not good in diagnosing distributive shock, so septic or anaphylactic shock. As you can see, the heart could be hyper or hypodynamic. The IVC could be flat or normal. So other than identifying sources of sepsis, Ultrasound is probably least useful in this group.
So please don't create another shock protocol. We have loads of them already. In this table, I think there's about 20 of them. So as you can see, they all look at the heart and most of them look at the IVC and then to varying degrees, they also look at other things like free fluid, aorta, the lungs, DVT. So you know, none of them are particularly better than any other, but I think it is good to use one so you have some kind of a structure or framework to work within. I quite like the high map just because it's easy to remember and it's quite a logical sequence. So next I'll just show you some examples of the pathologies that we look for in the high map exam. And just to remind you what we're looking for. So in the heart, three things we look for, tamponade, RV strain and LV impairment, IVC, whether it's full or collapsing, Morrison's for free fluid, aorta for both aneurysm and dissection, and then the pleura for tension pneumothorax, pleural effusion, and pulmonary edema. Okay, so what do you think of this image? This is a subcostal view. So this is the left ventricle here at the back, the right ventricle here, here are the atria, and this black or anechoic fluid here is pericardial fluid. So then the next question is, is the patient in tamponade or not? Of course, you can have a large pericardial effusion and not be in tamponade. So in tamponade, first the lowest pressure chamber is affected. So the right atrium is the lowest pressure chamber. So first you get right atrial collapse during atrial diastole. Then as the tamponade progresses and the pressure in the pericardial space increases, the next highest pressure chamber starts to collapse. So the right ventricle collapses during ventricular diastole. So there is a bit of bumping in of the free wall of the RV there, which looks suspicious for tamponade. But to know whether that's actually during ventricular diastole or not, we'd either have to have ECG leads attached or time the collapsing of the free wall with the valve opening and closing. So we don't know for sure, but I can tell you in this case, this was a case of tamponade. So the second thing that we look for in terms of the heart and shock is RV strain. So in the first image, this is a parasternal long axis. So this is the RV, this is the LV, this is the LA, mitral valve, aortic valve, ascending aorta. And I'm sure you can appreciate this right ventricle is massively dilated. It's really crushing this poor LV down below it. And on this parasternal short axis, we can see the RV here is massive. And it's just tiny little LV here. And we also see a thing called septal flattening. So normally the septum should be convex like this. So the LV should be round like a donut. But here this poor septum is being flattened. So the LV is taking on a capital D appearance. So this is also known as the D sign. So if you're interested in learning more about the signs of PE on point of ultrasound, check out my other video on POCUS and PE. So the next part of the high map is IVC. So in this image, here's the IVC draining into the right atrium. You can see a bit of hepatic veins here. And this IVC is clearly plethoric. So it's dilated more than two centimeters and it's not collapsing at all with respiration. What do you think of this image? So here's the IVC, here's the right atrium here. Can you see anything abnormal? So this is actually a big fat clot in the middle of the IVC there. So I just put that one in to keep you on your toes. And what do you think of this image? So the patient's thorax is here to the right of screen. This is the diaphragm and liver feet to the left of screen. Can you see the IVC? It's quite hard to see, isn't it? Because it's so narrow. It's actually just this little slit running along here, which just comes in and out of view. It's so narrow, it's actually hard to keep it in view for the whole respiratory cycle. So this is a very narrow collapsible IVC. So the third part of the high map protocol is M for Morrison's pouch, but this really just means a fast exam. So here we can see this black or anechoic area just around the tip of the liver here is free fluid. So in the context of trauma, this is most likely blood, but it could also be ascites or from a ruptured ectopic. And here are a couple of other examples of free fluid. So this is a pelvic view. So this is the bladder. And we can see a few little bits of black here just around the loops of bowel. So because loops of bowel are round and free fluid tends to fill in all the nooks and crannies between the loops of bowel, 
the black free fluid tends to take on this kind of spiky appearance because it fills in all those little cracks. And here's a left upper quadrant view. So here's the spleen, diaphragm, the patient's breathing in and out. So the lung is coming down, the lung curtain. And the free fluid here is actually between the spleen and the diaphragm, which is where it tends to collect in the left upper quadrant, as opposed to the right, where it tends to collect more in the Morrison's pouch between the liver and the kidney. So the fourth part of the high map is A for aorta. So I'm sure you can appreciate this is a big juicy triple A. So here's the vertebral body at the back. This is the aorta. And just a reminder to make sure you always include any intramural thrombus in your measurement. I'm sure you can appreciate if you only measured the lumen here, you'd massively underestimate its diameter. And as you know, the, the finding of a triple A doesn't tell you that it's ruptured or not. But if you have a patient in shock with no other obvious cause of shock and you see a big AAA, you know, that should ring alarm bells that it could be ruptured. And if the patient's stable enough, you can try and get a contrast CT to see if it is actually leaking. So as well as AAA, also keep your eyes out for dissection flaps. So here's a longitudinal view of the aorta. And this is the dissection flap just here. So just keep your eyes out for that. So the final part of the high map protocol is P for pleura. So in terms of pneumothorax, there are actually other things that can cause reduced lung sliding other than pneumothorax. For example, pneumonia, or if someone's intubated the right main stem, then you can lose lung sliding on the left, for example. So a more specific sign of a pneumothorax is the lung point. So this is the transition point between normal lung sliding and the absence of lung sliding. So if you can identify that lung point with ultrasound, it's much more specific for pneumothorax for ruling it in. So here on the ultrasound image, we have no sliding on the left and sliding on the right. So if you just rotate your probe so it's parallel to the ribs and then slide back posteriorly until you find the transition point, this is really useful for ruling in a pneumothorax. Of course, if the whole lung is collapsed, you won't see a lung point. And the second of the three things that we look for under P is pleural effusion. So in this image, we have the patient's head to the left of screen, feet to the right. This is the liver. And then this bright white line above the liver is the diaphragm. And all this black anechoic area here is fluid. And we know it's fluid because we can see the spine behind it. So normally you don't see the spine in the thorax because there's air filled lung here, which prevents the ultrasound making it down to the spine. But if there's something either solid or fluid, it transmits the ultrasound and this thoracic spine becomes visible. So that's called the spine sign. In this image, we also see some echogenic debris within the fluid, and that suggests that it's an exudate rather than a transudate, so probably infective or malignant. And here we have the classic appearance of pulmonary edema. So these bright white vertical lines that are coming down from the pleural line are called B lines, and these are not specific to anything. They basically just mean that there's some kind of a fluid gas interface, increased density. So the distribution and the pattern of the B lines is really important. So in pulmonary edema, they tend to be symmetrical, bilateral, more in the dependent areas, often with associated effusions, uh, often reduced LV function. In a viral pneumonitis, they tend to be more patchy and there may be some pleural line changes with it. So there may be pleural irregularity or thickening or little subpleural consolidations. But here the pleural line is thin and smooth and the B lines seem to be evenly distributed across these three intercostal spaces. So this looks pretty classic for pulmonary edema. Although of course we'd look at both lungs and get a whole overall impression of what's going on across the patient's lungs. So I think the high map system is good. It's easy to remember. It's a nice structure, but we should also have some flexibility. So, you know, we can leave out bits of the high map if we don't think they're relevant, and we can also add things on. So if you saw RV strain on the heart view, you may decide to look for a DVT. Or if you found no obvious source of shock and you were suspecting sepsis, you might look for sources of sepsis. So here's a DVT. So this is the femoral artery, femoral vein, we can see the echogenic clot within the vein there. And also this is without compression, this is with compression, and the anterior and posterior walls of the vein do not come together. 
This is the same thing in long axis, and we can see how the clot expands the vein here. And here's an example of pneumonia. So this is the liver. This bright white line is the diaphragm. And this tissue above the diaphragm looks similar to the liver tissue. So this is called hepatization of the lung. And if you look closely, there's also some tiny little air bubbles that are moving up and down within the lung. This is called dynamic air bronchograms and is supposedly more specific to consolidation than to atelectasis. Here's a classic example of acute cholecystitis. So this is the gallbladder. This is a stone sitting in the neck of the gallbladder with a shadow behind, a bit of sludge above it, and the gallbladder wall here is very thickened. So this is a classic sign of acute cholecystitis. So if you're not sure why the patient's shocked, you think maybe it's sepsis, and you see this, then you can be pretty sure it is sepsis, and also you have a source of their sepsis. And this is hydronephrosis. So you don't normally see the collecting system in a normal kidney, but here it's become very prominent because it's obstructed. So here's the pelvis, here's the major calyces and minor calyces. So in the context of a shocked patient, if you see hydronephrosis, this should make you worried that they could have urosepsis because of an obstructive urinary system. Okay, so now let's review some of the evidence for using ultrasound in shock. And let's start with Shokui et al, who was really born to write this paper, I think. So a relatively small prospective study, inclusion criteria, undifferentiated shock, and the results showed a significant reduction in diagnostic uncertainty. Also, they noted that this led to a change in treatment, imaging, and referral. A couple of years later, Saz Maz and his colleagues performed this slightly larger study looking at whether the initial diagnosis correlated with the final diagnosis with and without point of care ultrasound. So without POCUS, there was a 60% correlation, and with POCUS, an 85% correlation. Then the year after this, in 2018, Atkinson and his colleagues performed a larger multi-center trial looking at whether point-of-care ultrasound for undifferentiated shock actually conferred a survival advantage. And the result was that no, it didn't. There was no difference. However, there were some limitations with this trial. Because ultrasound was already fairly well established for undifferentiated shock, there were many exclusions. So if the patient had a suspected AAA or ruptured ectopic, they were excluded because it would be unethical to deprive them of what is already the standard of care. Also, more than half of the patients ended up having occult sepsis. And as we've said, this is probably the area where ultrasound is least useful. And also, because it was a study, they had to use a fairly rigid protocol. So they couldn't uh, allow any sort of nuance you know, adapting the protocol to the specific patient. Then the next year, 2019, Stickles and his friends performed a systematic review and meta-analysis. So four papers, just over 350 patients, and they looked at the diagnostic accuracy of POCUS for undifferentiated shock. And in this table, I've just listed the positive and negative likelihood ratios. So I think these are probably the most useful things in terms of how we factor it in with our pretest probability. So for hypovolemic shock, ultrasound was not that good. Positive likelihood ratio of 8, negative 0.2, so you, you generally want your positive likelihood ratio to be above 10 if it's a good test for ruling in and below 0.1 if it's a good test for ruling out. So not great for hypovolemic. <clears throat> for cardiogenic shock, it was good for ruling in, so a nice high positive likelihood ratio, but not great for ruling out. For obstructive shock, this was where POCUS was in its element. So a very high positive likelihood ratio and also a pretty good negative likelihood ratio as well. But for distributive and mixed shock, not so good. So overall, best for obstructive. So let's summarize the evidence. So there's no evidence of mortality benefit, as we know from the Atkinson paper, although, as we said, there are some limitations with that paper. But there is decent evidence now regarding diagnostic accuracy. We know it's best for obstructive shock, also good for ruling in cardiogenic shock, and worst for distributive shock. In my experience, it's just a really useful tool, especially for patients with undifferentiated shock. If the patient already has a clear source of their shock, if they're febrile, have a clear source of sepsis, then they don't, you don't need to mess around with an ultrasound, just give them IV antibiotics, source control, 
But if it's really undifferentiated shock, you have no idea why they're hypotensive. You know, just the two minutes that it takes to perform a high map can sometimes give you an immediate diagnosis. So if it's used in an intelligent way, I think we should be performing a focused shock protocol on all our patients with undifferentiated shock. So IFEM, the International Federation of Emergency Medicine, in 2016, gave recommendations for how ultrasound should be used in both shock and cardiac arrest. And they came up with this lovely rainbow picture here. So core ultrasound views, supplementary and additional. So core views are echo, lung and IVC. Supplementary is basically further echo views. And then additional views are things like DVT, AAA, free fluid. So this fits with my philosophy on how to use ultrasound in shock. I think we should have some flexibility and some nuance. We shouldn't just stick to a rigid protocol. In the first case, you know, aorta was not really relevant in a 15-year-old boy, so you can skip over that. However, if you suspect uh, PE, then by all means go and look for a DVT because that's actually much more specific for PE than RV strain. So I like this consensus statement because it allows for a degree of intelligent, nuanced scanning by the provider. Well, thanks very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email.